My guest today is G.A. Bartik, president of Concilio and author of Silver Bullet Selling, Six Critical Steps to Opening More Relationships and Closing More Sales. Sales, I think, is a performance art, and to work with coaches like G.A. is a tremendous experience, though I am often struck with just how poorly trained I am and how good they are at it and how good G.A. is at this. We will capture some of that energy today and learn some things about selling. G.A., welcome to the show. Hey, David, glad to be here. Excited to talk about this. As you know, sales is in my DNA and just runs through my body. So excited to share any thoughts and just have a great discussion about, hey, what it takes to be successful in sales today. Well, we will expose your body over audio today, GA. Uh, here's our first question. See, the old school insurance broker world, which is the world where I live, and I have lived for a long time, and I've seen this pattern play out where you have an alpha producer who worked somewhere else and left, put out their own shingle, and they started a business. Uh, and basically the limit of that business, for the most part, of, I think everywhere I've seen it, has been the limit of what that producer can do with his or her time. Maybe one or two other people will join them who will also be, we call alpha producers, but they find it virtually impossible to scale their business beyond that, beyond what they can do. What are they doing wrong? Well, it comes down to really their belief system that, hey, I'm great at what I do, so therefore I can bring on a team and teach them what to do and how to do it like me. And most people have never been taught, A, how to manage and coach a team. So being an individual producer is much different than leading a team and an organization of producers. So they use this kind of watch me method. They hire people and they say, okay, watch me do this. And they think by that watch me osmosis, they will become top producers like them. So we teach what we call the skills transfer process. Again, most people have never been taught how to train somebody else. But the skills transfer process, five steps of explain, demonstrate, practice with coaching, observe, and feed forward is really how you can go about teaching and training somebody. So again, we work with a lot of top producers when they go out there and they hang their own shingle. They think, okay, I'm going to bring other producers in underneath me, and I'm going to then extrapolate that out. I'm going to make more money because I'll have more producers writing more business, and they fail miserably. Why? A, they don't know how to run the business correctly. They don't know how to set expectations, hold people accountable, and then actually run a business versus being in the business. And number two, it's that, it's that training piece. It's that old school of, hey, watch me do this, and you'll learn, because that's how they were taught. But today, that just doesn't work. They have to use that, be able to transfer skills effectively across their entire organization. Yeah, that, that's a, uh, really interesting. I, I'm reminded of a quote that I read once. I think it was attributed to Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel. I think so, uh, or, or something like that, where he said, every, sales, every salesman uh, thinks he can be a manager. This is a gender biased thing because it was a long time ago. And, and so what's amusing about that is, is that why is that true? And that's true because, in the sense in which it's true, is that I think that when you look at managers, you think the thing that they do, really all they do, is communicate, right? And salespeople are necessarily very good communicators. It is the essence of what they do as well, right? And I think you have to be a phenomenal communicator to be a phenomenal salesperson. So if you are a phenomenal salesperson, you then think to yourself, well, I'm an amazing communicator and managers are only communicators, therefore I must be a great manager too, or I can easily become a great manager too. But they're not. It's a distinct skill. It's a different kind of skill. But, you know, they have the raw materials, right? So presumably, you know, what, what, where is the failing? Is it the kind of communication? Is there, some, is there some urge that they're satisfying with the communication skills that they have when they're selling that is a very different thing they have to satisfy when they're managing? You, you, you hit it spot on. Oftentimes they think, hey, I'm very persuasive. I am able to get people to buy from me. So therefore, I should then be a great leader. But sitting there in a sales situation is very much different than being in a leadership situation. We see it all the time. Here's what usually happens in organizations. David's a great producer. We have a leadership position open up. We post it on Monday. David, you apply for it and interview it on Wednesday. And Friday, we say, congratulations, David. Monday morning, you're a supervisor. And now you got a team of eight or 10, 12 producers underneath you. And again, the skill set of being a manager of how do you set crystal clear expectations? How do you hold people accountable? How do you run a team meeting? How do you transfer skills? How do you have a difficult conversation with somebody who's underperforming? Those are all skills that most people have never been taught. And those are the skills, even though you're a good communicator and potentially a good motivator, 
those are not enough skills to carry you through to be a really truly a great manager of people. And there's a teaching element to this. You mentioned earlier when you want to educate somebody, it's the show me method, but there's a different kind of structured way to educate. Here's one thing I noticed in reading your book, which is fantastic, and, and a few other sales books which you reference in your book as being inspirations to you. Uh, importantly, there's the spin method and there's consultative selling, are the two books by Rackman and uh, Rack, Rackham, Neil Rackham and um, Matt Cannon. Uh, and what's interesting about these books and a few other sales books is they, they're very teaching focused right? They're teaching books. And if you read that versus like other nonfiction books, right? Just a whole pile of content, which it kind of flies through your head, right? But I get the sense that when I'm reading sales books, that there's a real desire on behalf of the author to actually have you learn this, <laughs> right? So there's exercises and you have it in your book too, right? Saying, hey, fill this out and think about your situation. And it's sort of like, it's, it's more like a class you're trying to run through a book. Uh, so I, I think of these as maybe some of the most intentful educational uh, uh, artifacts for selling should should sales managers write books <laughs> right I mean you're in the sales business you wrote a book many people seem to do that is that something people should do more of actually I'm glad you brought that up I don't know if I talked to you about this David but in March hopefully if our publisher can, can get everything done we have a book all on middle management everything we've been talking about so far we have coming out and again it's, it's a teaching book and here's the, the reason I wrote silver bullet selling is I started my background at Nordstrom and I was so much successful, but I, I spent a short time selling and about 11 years in managing. When I left there, I failed miserably in sales. Why? Because I had no process. I was simply winging it. So then I started reading all these books and Gittermer and Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy. And they're all were kind of tips and tricks on what to do, but I'm a process person. So I needed a process. So when I started interviewing these top performing salespeople, I started seeing that they don't wing it. They almost always have a process in place. And that's where the six critical steps of silver bullet selling came to be. To tell you the truth, it was originally called No Silver Bullet to Sales. That's what the book was originally <laughs> titled. And the reason it was titled that because I didn't think there was any silver bullet. That if you did a poor job of pre-call planning before the meeting, if you didn't build very much rapport, you asked very few discovery questions, your solution was really just features and no benefits, you were very confrontational on how you address concerns, you didn't ask for the order, but or at the end, if you could do a poor job and all that stuff, but if you said this magical phrase, like there's a books on a thousand one closing techniques, if you do a poor job and all that stuff, but you say this magical phrase, that once you say that phrase, the heavens will part, the light's gonna shine down in your prospect, and they'll hear that heavenly music, it sounds like, ah, and then they'll change their mind. And that's what kind of sales was in old school sales. So when I started doing these interviews and trying to figure out why am I failing at sales, and I failed miserably at it, you know, at 30 years old, I had a paper route because I just had to make a few dollars, so I kept failing in sales. I started interviewing people, 6,000 interviews later, I realized that people don't wing it, but there is a silver bullet, and it's those six steps that I saw people doing, whether it was conscious or unconscious, over and over and over again. How did they pre-call plan before the meeting? How did they make sure the best version of themselves showed up? How did they then start the meeting off with a great agenda, a short credibility statement? How did they build rapport? How did they then take a genuine interest in the other person and do really good deep discovery? Then how did they really present a benefit-rich solution? Then when they address concerns, they are very non-confrontational. It was a very different approach that I saw these really top performers take. Then how did they ask for the order? But here's the thing I kept seeing over and over again. Those first five steps of pre-call planning, build report, discovery, tailored to address concerns. If those were done well, closing just seemed to be the natural next step. And that's why I changed the book from no silver bullet to silver bullet. Because I realized the silver bullet really truly is those six steps. So that's really, you know, kind of what we're seeing is kind of new school sales. And that's why we're, we're writing this next book on leadership, on this middle manager. Because they're the ones who seem to be stuck in the middle. Oftentimes they're good producers. Now they're put in this managerial role and they don't have a track to run down. So I'm going to step outside and, and Stacy McKibben, my business partner in Concilio, we will hopefully shortly be coming out with our middle management book, yet to be titled. Okay, I look forward to I look forward to seeing that. Now I want to do I do want to come back to the idea of old school selling because 
I, I, in particular, the when I was when I was doing some research for this, reading these other books, uh, I tend for whatever reason I wind up getting prints of them that were old from the '80s, maybe early '90s, and they were ruthless in their criticism of old school sales. And the thousand and one closing, closing in particular, features quite prominently in Rackham's book Spin Selling, where they, they say that that's not the way you do it. And to me, I always get a little, I don't know uncomfortable or not sort of wary is the word when I hear people say well this time it's different now everybody's different humans are so different today than they were 100 years ago which I just generally don't buy it I think people were the same back then and you know it's like the kids these days you know they don't they're, all they do is watching the screens and they're you know Socrates hated books because that was people which should have just talked to each other right and so that was like you know 3,000 years ago 2,000 years ago <clears throat> so if, if people were the same then what was different did these techniques work then why was this the conventional wisdom for sales back 60, 70, 80 years ago that you that you have to have a closer, that you have to have some way of applying pressure onto somebody, which now we say that's ridiculous. And and listen, I was a salesman for a bunch of years. I didn't know anybody who applied real pressure in a sales environment. That was nuts. You'd be out of your mind to do that. They will, they will, they will boot you out of the office. But did it ever work, do you think? So I think that whole finding their pain and really accentuating that pain, find the pain, rub some salt in that pain, and if there's enough pain, they would move forward. And so you read all these books, they talk about find their pain points. And a lot of times they work with salespeople and the first few questions they start to ask are trying to uncover these pain points. And what we find and why I kind of call that whole pain process old school, I believe today's rule that pain causes paralysis, excitement causes movement. Let me explain what I mean by that. Is that I think the one that's a little bit different than you know today than before 10 15 20 years ago people were very very secure in their job they'd work for a company for 20 30 years get a nice pension be able to retire in their 50s or 60s and live a nice retired life but i don't think that's the case anymore is that you can just have a job work there 20 30 years get that nice pension People are a little bit more fearful, especially today. And we do a lot of research and talk to buyers and, and talk, do a lot of, of research on working with our clients. And we'll sit there and go into a meeting and have the salesperson leave and we'll interview the prospect. And one of the biggest fears they have right now is I may not like my current vendor, but you know what? I haven't gotten fired over it. And change is more painful today than ever. So people are avoiding the pain. So old school says find the pain. What we're finding today though is that people can endure a whole lot of pain, especially if they see it's not gonna get them fired or anything. But if I change and it doesn't work out well, that could look bad on me. So what we have to do is we have to get them excited about A, going and potentially talking to their boss or a board or, or a team and saying, hey, I wanna change vendors. I wanna bring a new product in. And sometimes the vendor that we're gonna, you're gonna take over is a vendor they brought in. And so it takes some courage, but more importantly, it takes risk to be able to do that. And it's risk and reward. If I can get excited about what this new vendor, what this new product can do for me and can help me reach my goals, then I'm willing to take the risk and bring them in. So that's a totally different conversation than, hey, let me find out what pain you have. And if you have enough pain, you'll move because we're finding that people are not moving for pain. They're moving for excitement. Can this product or service help me reach my goals, help me look good in front of my organization, help me be and run a more successful business? So old school, pain, mm. new school, excitement. Uh, that is very interesting. Uh you know, the world is more painful, maybe as a way of thinking about it now than it was but a little more comfortable perhaps back then. But they'd rather do let nothing. Me, they'd if it's painful, they'd rather yeah. stick they can stick people can endure a lot of pain. Let me, let me give you uh, another possible angle. Let me, let me think of this. So uh, inspired by, um, by Spin Selling, by Rackham's book, he, he made the point that, which is not a distinction you make, which is interesting in your book, between small ticket items and large ticket items. Right? So he says small ticket items are just different. So they're different, and he's kind of reconciling the old school view with the new school view and says old school is more small ticket. And with small ticket items, you can talk a bit more about, about, um, about kind of like wants as opposed to needs. You can talk about features. You can talk about um, pain. You sort of have more flexibility. And then you can apply a closing formula and apply pressure and get a sale. Somebody's selling something for 30 bucks maybe. As opposed to the a large corporate, you know, if you're buying jet turbines from Rolls-Royce or GE, that, that just doesn't work, right? So 
that that and so that if that's true, and I'd interest your thought because I think that you uniquely have experience across a wide spectrum of ticket sizes. Uh, if that's true, then the interpretation of new school versus old school is in the old school, we were just selling more small ticket things. And these days, you don't tend to employ a salesperson to small, sell a small ticket item. That gets happened, happens automatically. And then kind of the weighted average of all the salespeople are focused on just on bigger ticket items. And that will just be a different culture, but it always was a different culture. What do you think? You know, I, I, I think you're, you're, you're on to that. The, the, the key difference being is that I think relationships are more important than ever before. I think that kind of, you know, Neil Rackham stuff, love it, and it's great stuff, especially the big ticket stuff. The relationship was really, really important, super important. Then I think people went away from the relationship and really became kind of cost um, specific and really looking for the best cost, the best terms. But I think it's gone back and the pendulum swung back to people are still looking today for a relationship, whether it's on a large ticket item or a small ticket item. And so, are you as a salesperson, even it might just be a one and done type small ticket, but they're still looking for the relationship, especially if you're not the low cost leader. What's the reason why they should buy your product over another product? And what we're seeing too is how do we take the commoditization out of products? It's really what I work a, work a lot with my clients on is how do you take a genuine interest and a holistic approach and find out, hey, where's this company at and where does it want to go? And then can my product or service bridge that gap? And that's what people are looking for. And again, most salespeople go in wanting to solve a specific problem. I want to take, I want to solve a problem, but I want to make a much more holistic approach to how we solve that problem so that I can expand that sale to other products, products and services that we have to offer too. If I take a much more holistic versus a laser pointed uh, approach to one product. You know what's interesting about that? You make this comment in your book, which I found amusing because I was thinking this before you said it, uh, which was you said, "Well, my industry is different, right?" And you're coming at an angle here, which is pretty, which is pretty uh, interesting. Where, like, in a world where differentiation is the key, what you're selling is differentiation, right? So you're saying we're going to tailor a sales process to your product, and you are different, and you are special, and we're gonna we're gonna manifest that in a process. And so when somebody says to you, "My business is different," you say to them, "I know." <laughs> that, that is what I'm selling is that you're different and you know so maybe you can tell me a little bit about how organization is different and what you might bring to them as a different sales process all right so everybody's listening to this you know hang out hang with me for a moment here because you and I all know that our clients are pretty close to the same all right they are when I'm working with organizations and where we you know whether we're working with Google or YouTube or hotels.com Expedia any of our clients we're working with big and small my clients, they're pretty similar, but they don't think they are. And that is the key, that every one of your clients, every one of your prospects, they think that their situation is totally different and unique. And you might have worked and sold and, and, and had clients in my industry, in my vertical, you might have 100 of them, but my company, we're totally different and unique. That, my friends, is what every single one of your prospects is thinking. So a big part of the silver bullet selling process that we tailor to each one of our clients is how do you, again, show that genuine interest and take a much more holistic approach to understanding where the business has been, where the person you're talking to, where they've been, where they are right now and where they wanna go. And it's all about discovery. I think discovery is the heart and soul of the sales process. And it is the number one part of the sales process that most salespeople skip. Reason being, they think, oh my gosh, I've heard this 437 times before. I know the solution. Let me tell you how smart I am and let me give you a solution. It doesn't work that way, people. You need your prospect to sit there and say, oh my gosh, these guys get us. You know, my very first sale in consulting was to Oakley Sunglasses. And on a cold call, I got an opportunity to meet with their head of their call center. And it was a customer service call center where they were taking calls where people wanted new nose pads, lenses, or temples for their sunglasses. And they wanted to transition from a customer service call into a sales call selling new Oakley products, their shoes, their backpacks, their clothing line. And so I sat down with the GM of this call center 
and I went through our sales process of pre-call planning. I built rapport with her. I did my discovery in a much more holistic approach. And when I did my discovery summary, I sit there and, and said, so you have a team of 13 people that they're taking inbound calls for people who are looking to replace their temples, their lenses, or their, or their nose pads, and that the team loves the customers that they, that they, that they bring. But you want to transition this from being kind of a cost center to a profit center by cross-selling other products and services. But you got to make sure you don't do it salesy. And really what your, your expectations of a sales team, a training consultant, somebody could come in here, customize the program, and really make sure that it has Oakley's brand on it and the Oakley experience and not make it salesy, but quickly customer service-esque transition to a sales conversation. Is that pretty much everything we discussed? Anything I missed? And she goes, GA, here's what's going really going on. Our sales are flat year over year, and I was brought in to increase the sales of this department. I'm afraid if I don't increase the sales, I just may lose my job. So I said, thank you so much. Let me get, put together my proposal. Now, I was up against two other multinational companies and my little company, and when we got the job, I asked her, like, just kind of curious, why did you choose us? And she said, GA, it was obvious that you knew our situation better than anybody else did it, that you got us. Now, again, my solution of sales training and coaching was, I'm sure, very similar to everybody else's she looked at. And I know we're not the cheapest on the block, but through the discovery process, I was able to demonstrate that I understand understood her unique situation. And that's what people today want more than ever be, than before, is they want to sit there and talk to somebody who really gets them. So um, coincidentally, I should say, because it shouldn't be ironic, um, you're a good salesman, <laughs> right? Uh, probably not a coincidence either, necessarily. And what's interesting is that you're, uh, I mean, the whole sales business is, a, is selling sales consulting is an, it must be an interesting kind of like recursive thing for you where you're talking about sales and then living it yourself. Uh, and I do want to actually talk about that, which I find interesting. Uh, but I do I want to come back to this point you made there about discovery is the heart and soul of sales. Because when I read Consultative Selling by Matt Cannon, and I got the, the, the copy that was printed in like 1977 or something like that, um, it, it reads like a um, manifesto on discovery and, and then it's a very specific way of, of actually presenting your discovery of your solution, right? So it's all about understanding the client, all about understanding the client and it's just on and on and it's kind of repetitive, honestly, um, but, but it's good stuff in the sense that it's one of these simple things that you really have to drill into your head because if you mess it up and most people do, you sort of go to an aisle pilot and you don't actually do the discovery properly, then you miss something important and you lose the client. And they're like, and you, you might not, you might miss something important, but more importantly, it's that emotional need that you miss. And what we're seeing is most salespeople are selling logically versus emotionally. They sit there and they understand what are your needs, what do you need, how much of it do you need, when do you need it by, and that's all logical. People don't buy logically, folks. They buy emotionally and they rationalize it logically. And this whole emotional needs, that's what discovery is all about is how do I tap into the emotional need of my prospect so then I can get them excited emotionally about moving forward with our product and service. You know, it's interesting about the emotional side because I think I think of the rapport building section, right, which you, you touch on in the book. And I, I actually wasn't really there in some of the other books I've, I was reading where they sort of skip over a little bit. It's sort of, this is obviously what you do. To me, the rapport building part uh, is, is kind of like the the, the heart and soul of the, let's call it the cultural bias of a salesperson, that's kind of like the thing that salespeople, that's the reason why they're in sales, is they can do that, or they do that all the time, right? So yes, anybody can be a salesperson, I believe that. I've seen some very awkward, weird people be very successful salespeople, it happens all the time, but that is the exception. For the most part, you get people who like talking to people and who like building rapport as a habit, and they're the ones who go into sales because you get that first five minutes, but then we skip over it, at, right? Uh, and, you know, the point you made there about emotional content is important to me because there is a balance, right? So you say they buy emotionally, but you can't just walk in and 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 just give them a hug, right? And say, I'm going to take care of you, right? There's got to be some, there's got to be some real hard content in there as well, right? So it's actually this interesting mix of emotional and then uh, use the word rational, but let's call it business decision making and business advisory and consultation that has to happen. Um, you know, is it that we just err on the side of business too much? 
I'm sure the people fail for the other reason too. Uh, I, I think that often, sometimes people are, un, un, are unconsciously competent. Some of these really top salespeople, they build rapport beautifully, but they also do a lot of other things very, very well. They do a good job of discovery. They do a good job of presenting benefits versus just features. You can't just go in there and give them a hug and say, great, they'll buy for me. And I mean, how many times have a have you or anybody listening to this have gone in there and walked out of me and saying, oh my God, that was great. I, we, we, we just had such a great connection and they still didn't buy from you. Totally. I had a great conversation. Yeah, we had a great conversation. And sometimes it's the what, the great conversations that are just way too easy that I oftentimes lose that sale. And it comes yeah. down to understanding what we call their primary motivating factor. And again, this is this emotional need, their primary motivating factor. I, I, was, I was having an issue with my bank. And so whenever we get a check, Shawnee, my marketing person, would always volunteer to take the check down to the bank. Now our bank, I live in San Diego, and our bank is actually right on the pier on the beach. So in the summertime, it would take Shawnee sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes two hours to get back from the bank. Now her nails always looked a lot better when she got back. <laughs> but, but no, so it was a serious, so it was a, I called up my banker and I said, hey, Eleanor, um, we have an issue that just in the summertime here where the bank gets so crowded because everybody's at the beach, it takes, too, it takes Shawnee way too long to deposit checks. What can we do? And Eleanor, my banker, said, well, GA, if Shawnee comes in and there's a big long line, just have her come and sit down or just have her come to my office and drop the check off to me or just lay it on my desk. Well, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Eleanor's desk, but it's got file folders of people's bank statements and all their, their loan documents. It's, it's just stacked and stacked and stacked all over her desk. It's a mess. The last thing I want to do is put a big fat check on her desk to only have it lost, you know, to never be excavated again. So that was not a great solution. So a, a gentleman cold called me from a bank, which... I usually don't. I mean, I, actually, I take a lot of cold calls. I like to hear what people say. But sure, in a moment yeah. of weakness, I said, come on down and check out and see if we can work, talk to you about banking with you. And he sat down and he took such a genuine interest in our company and me. He had done his research. He knew a little bit about me. He asked some really great questions. Nothing about banking. He wanted to know, how did Concilio start? How did I get started in consulting? What's going on with Concilio right now? Where's Concilio want to go? What's that mean for you? And so he really took this, this holistic approach to my company and me. And then he said, okay, great. After I understood where we've been, where we are, where we want to go, then he started asking me some banking questions. And I explained the whole situation about Shawnee. He goes, he goes, well, GA, if Shawnee spent less time banking and more time marketing, what would that do for you? He said, oh, well, I'm, ass I'm assuming that would get us more clients. And again, without being interrogative, he just simply asked another very inquisitive question. He says, well, gee, if you got more clients, what would that do? Well, we'd make more money. And he said, well, would you make more money too? I said, absolutely. And then again, he had earned the right now to ask this question. He said, well, GA, and why he earned the right? Because he had taken so much time and it wasn't, you know, it was probably 10, 15 minutes, but he really sat there and really understood me in my business. So he said, gee, if you made more money, what would you do with that? I said, oh, that's obvious. I would use that to put my kids through college. Now, I had to put myself through school. It took me six years. My wife had to put herself through school, too. We've been married 29 years. We have three kids. We made a promise to each one of our kids that they would get four years of school and a car from us. So when he said, what would I do with a little bit more money? I would use it to put my kids through college. He goes, well, great. We have a scanner. You can put the scanner right on your desk, GA. Shawnee can just de deposit the checks through the scanner. She'll shred them. They get automatically deposited. She'll spend more time marketing, which will be more clients, which will be more money for the company, which should be more money for you, GA, so you can use that to put your kids through college. Again, was I excited about putting my kids through college? He said, his next question was, so GA, how many scanners do you want? Well, you only need one scanner. But I say, this sounds great, but you know what? Let me think about it. I'm sure you've all heard that before. And I went home that night. I said, hey, honey, I'm thinking about switching banks. She goes, well, why would you want to do that, honey? I'm like, you know, I'm always complaining about Shawnee and how long it takes her to get to the bank. Well, this banker's going to give us a scanner. We'll put it right on Shawnee's desk. Whenever we get a check, she'll scan the check. It's automatically deposited. She shreds the check. Then she'll spend more time marketing, honey. More marketing means more clients. More clients should be more money for the company, which should mean more money for us. And we can use that money to put our kids through college. David, what did my wife go tell me to do? <laughs> get the scanner. 
Get the scanner, switch banks. Yeah. Here's the key, folks. Have you ever switched banks? Is that a pain in the butt to do? Brutal. Why was I so excited to do something that was painful? Because it was going to get me the exciting ending of putting my kids through college. So here's the key, though. So, again, painful activity got me pleasant results. That's why I was able to change. Because my primary motivating factor, that emotional need, was to get my kids through college, and the scanner was going to help me do it. The sad part of the story, if I could put, put a bow on this, David, I called Eleanor, my banker, and said, hey, Eleanor, I appreciate all your work for the last several years, but we're switching banks. And the first question she asked was? Who are you going to? That was her second or question. Why? 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 And I said, yeah. we know I was complaining about how long it took us to deposit. This bank we're going to go to is going to give us a scanner. And what did she say? We have a scanner, too. <laughs> well, how come you never told me about it? Oh, right. And she said, you never asked, GA. So let me ask you this too. Do you have clients who should be using products or services of yours that they're not because they may not know that you offer them? So make sure that you take a holistic approach, understand their primary motivating factor, their emotional needs. So they will sometimes do something that's uncomfortable and difficult like changing banks because it'll get them pleasant results. And again, the only way you get to all that is by doing deep, really holistic discovery. So let me, let me, let me throw another story on the table here, which is from, from, your, from your book. Uh, and the, the theme here is, what if they can't tell you? So there, there's, um, there's the story you told about uh, two landscaping companies. And you, you had funny names on those, like Big Bold and Small and Unassuming or something. Where you yep. had, one that had the fancy truck with the branding and the guy was looked great or whatever he worked out and then the other one was uh was a uh, also a guy but was unassuming right yep cut to the chase the second guy read silver bullet selling clearly and did the whole discovery and then and you wound up buying more from him than you would have from from the big bold guy so here's the here's the thing so totally get it and i'm buying what you're selling but not everybody is right so big bold exists and i would even i would say like I would like to suspend disbelief for a second and assume that Big Bold is succeeding. Because he might not be, but let's say so Absolutely he they are. He's also selling something that people want, but it's not this consultative stuff, right? He's selling something else, right? And there's a there's a, an author who I had on this show, actually, a guy named Robin Hanson, wrote a book called The Elephant in the Brain. It says, you know, we have secret motivations for things, which usually boil down to a status-seeking kind of thing, right? I want to affiliate with something fancy, something impressive, that I can say to people, I went with Big Bull. They're like, ooh, wow, wow, that's cool, wow. How was, how was he, right? And then they're, and then you're, you're not getting the product. You're buying something else, right? You're buying this other thing, which you would never admit <laughs> in a consultative selling uh, interview, I would think, maybe. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, yes, Big Bull would it be Big Bull if they were not out there selling and being successful. The, the, the key is taking a look at, you know, what are you selling and where do you fit? And are you the low cost leader or not? Are you the big brand name? I mean, if everybody just went on function, then Mercedes BMW wouldn't be around. All right. Because any, you know, a Yugo can get you there. But yeah, so people do have comfort in going with a big brand because they've done it before. So that, again, there's a little bit of risk maybe going with a smaller brand. But what I oftentimes take a look at is a, do they have a pretty good reputation and have people sit there and had good experiences with them? And, and so I will oftentimes ask for referrals, but again, it's that, that experience that, that I want that, that little bit of a, that, that velvet glove treatment. And can I get that from the smaller person? I can potentially get that from the big, big bold also. You know, I just, again, it comes down to the really, is this person going to meet my needs? Cause Hey, my needs are, are, are unique and specific. And in that situation with my backyard, I was talking to one landscaper. It came in, asked me two questions, started mapping out my backyard the way he, way he wanted it. Yeah. And the other guy sat down and really thought through it. And, and again, here's the, 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 could they have both come up with the same backyard? Maybe they could have, but the buying experience, and that's really what we really concentrate on. What is the unique and different buying experience you are creating for your prospect? The buying experience with me, with, with, the other, with the other gentleman who took the time to, to get to know me, was just, a for me, a better buying experience. So, therefore, we went with him. So, let, let, me, 
Let me throw a few thoughts out, uh, and I do this with a sheepish smile on my face, GA, but about how insurance is different, uh, dare I say it. Now, there, I, there, are, there are a couple of things that I just, I want to kind of put out there, and you can tell me what you think of this, right? And, you, and you've been involved in some insurance stuff in addition to all your other really impressive uh, work you've done. And so, to me, the interesting thing about insurance is you're not typically buying because you want the thing, right? You're buying because somebody's telling you to do it, right? Uh, either the government is telling you to buy an auto liability policy, or maybe your wife is telling you, or husband, telling you to buy some life insurance because you've got to put the kids through school, business partner, right? So the interesting feature about insurance is the, is the act of compulsion. Very few, I would say almost no, people who buy insurance buy it because they are interested in the risk management benefits of insurance for themselves, right? Somebody else wants yes. the risk management benefits of your insurance policy. Or, you know, actuaries right? like you, David, love to get into that stuff. And they tell you all about it. Now, does, does, it, does the dynamic, how do you handle the dynamic where you, you know, buying a product that you don't really understand why you need it, you actually don't really think really you need it, but you're just being told to buy it. Now, what is the differentiate? Because how do you differentiate yourself there? Because you can ask Discovery and they're going to say, well, I don't know, I don't want it. What do you do then? How, how do you work through that? And do you agree that that is something that is an interesting problem about insurance? You can it's it's definitely unique in the insurance world that most insurance, especially life insurance, the person who's buying it does not benefit from it. How, what product or service out there in the world are you selling to somebody who doesn't get a benefit from what they're buying? And so, again, quote, unquote, peace of mind. You know, what is that? So Worthless. It's yes. not worth any money. That's what it is. Exactly. So, again, then insurance, <clears throat> talk about an emotional purchase. And that's why, again, it's so important that you take a that holistic approach really understanding what is the person trying to solve what do they what would look what would it look like and I, can, I, I can talk about what would happen if they do nothing and i will talk about that little bit of pain but then i'm going to quickly move it forward to what would happen if they do something and how that's going to look but again because dare i say it that insurance can be very easily commoditized and go to the just you know people can just sit there and go online and buy it if they want then why even use an agent? And why do agents still exist? Because people, again, I think it's swinging around. They still want that human interaction. They want that relationship. I think today more than ever before. And we're seeing that with, with COVID, that the need for human interaction has just been amplified. So when they sell an insurance, a product that, yes, do they need it or not? No, but in the whole process of the selling and understanding the person, it comes down to, hey, can I create a unique and different experience? Because most of the time, they're going to talk to two or three other insurance salespeople. We've already proven that out. The stats are out there for that. If you're not going to be the lowest cost, why should they go with you? And that's going to be, A, how do you present your solution how it's going to benefit them, and do they trust and like you too? And again, that trust and like, it's not about the nice big hug you get, but can they sit there and say to themselves, wow, does David really understand my unique situation? Because again, everybody who's buying insurance, they think that their situation is totally different than anybody else's out there. You know, I had this interesting experience a few years ago working with a, um, an insurance company who was had a direct-to-consumer arm, right? So they had marketing to people and they were selling in a call center, and they also went through agents. And they had, uh, in addition to that, they had a wholesaler arm, which was agents' agents. And the amazing thing to them was that they had this wholesale, because here, here's how that works, right? So you're going to buy this insurance policy from this company. You, a customer, I, could go online and buy the policy. And then instead I say, you know what, I'm going to go to my agent. And the agent says, I could go online to the same web portal and I could buy this insurance policy. The agent says, you know, I'm going to go to an agent. We have the same, gee, it's, it's insane. It's, it's something profound about this, actually. It's so crazy. It's, it, it's that we've got to force ourselves to acknowledge that reality is not what we think. They could all do the same thing. And they've introduced two layers of cost into the transaction because nobody wants to do the work. So there's something like deeply allergic uh, um, about insurance, about actually buying insurance. The people just don't want to touch it. You know, they don't want to go anywhere near it. They have to do it every year. They don't want to, you know, they need somebody to kind of help them through the process. And in that sense, like, it feels to me, I wonder if you agree with this distinction, a small ticket item that kind of behaves like a big ticket item. It might only cost you 30, 40 bucks a month, but you want to spend as little work on it as, you know, as if you're buying Rolls Royce jet engines and you're like, somebody, the vendor, help me out with it. 
Do you agree with that characterization? Yeah. You know, in a lot of ways, absolutely. It is this, it's just so interesting with, with insurance and it's people know they need it. And whether it's, you know, again, we work a lot with auto insurance and in life and health insurance and the people, again, they can do it with absolutely no interaction and lots of people do. But why are insurance people still out there today? Because people don't want to go through the headache and try to understand and figure it all out. They would rather talk to somebody who's a pro who knows it. I mean, I just brought, I just got health insurance for my organization and have a great person who kind of walked me through it. And, and I had my, had my life and health license, so I know a lot about health insurance, but I don't want to go through that myself. So it's, you know, looking at this small ticket item, high, big ticket item, something like insurance. A lot of people still want to have that personal touch and have somebody help me figure out what's the best policy, what's the best thing for me, so I don't have to do all the research. How about big ticket items? We haven't talked about that too much. Um, adapting your process for larger sales, like what changes? It takes longer. What does that mean? It's well, it, what's fascinating to me, the six steps, they don't change. Right. right. They don't change at all of what you need to do and how you need to do it. What changes though is really understanding how do you navigate the organization? And that's a whole nother piece of selling and understanding who is the buyer. Are you talking to the economic buyer? Are you talking to the influence buyer? And what we're seeing happening today more than ever before, you as a salesperson, you can sit there and if David's my prospect and he's my influential buyer, I'm talking to David, he may even be the person who's gonna use the product, but more times than not, he's not the economic buyer. So David says, hey, GA, I love what you guys are selling. This is great, it's the exact product we need. Let me go talk to my team. Let me go talk to my boss. And then when David goes and talks to the team or his boss about bringing in my product or service, where am I during that conversation? I'm not there. And are, we're seeing that happening more and more often. The final decision to move forward is happening in a conversation where the salesperson is not even in the room. So what I need to do is be able to educate my influential buyer. I need to let, how can David communicate on my behalf when I'm not there? So a lot of the tools we teach, the why us three by three. Hey, there's three reasons why clients work with us. Success stories. There's different tools of communication that we teach that help David communicate on my behalf where the sale is made when I'm not even there. And that's a big piece that a lot of salespeople miss is how do I educate in a clear, concise, easy story type methodology so that my emotional buyer, my influential buyer can go in there and talk. And that's what the feather that could tip the scale my way is how he talks about me versus the other two companies he might've talked to because he's his boss is, what are the other, what are our other options? And I got to make sure that David talks best about me. That's hard. That's so, hard to do. It, it's, it feels to me like this is almost a sales training seminar you got to give as a salesperson, right? So you're going to go into the buyer. You're going to say, I'm going to teach you how to sell this. Because yes. I, as you say, I ain't going to be there. Yep, exactly. So, and I have actually done times where we've actually done role playing with the influential buyer on how he's going to communicate. When he, when he walks in there, and here's the thing too. A lot of times that influential buyer, they may be the person who chose the current vendor. So, sure. So for example, let's talk, let's talk about, about insurance or financial advisors. You know, they may be the person who, uh, who, who chose the current financial advisor. I can't put down that current financial advisor, or it may be the person who chose their current logistics vendor. I'm going to my boss now and say, Hey boss, I want to change vendors. How can they do that in a way where it doesn't make them look bad about the vendor they, they're using right now that they chose? And so again, it's about selling forward is a big methodology we talk about. Selling forward is get again, get them excited about the future. Hey, that other company, David, they've been great for the last four years. We're just a different company today. They've done a great job getting us to where we are today. I wanna change vendors because, hey, we wanna expand. We wanna open up two more locations and this new vendor is gonna allow us to do that. So again, it's about understanding the holistic approach to where they are, where they want to go, and then 
helping my influential buyer be able to communicate and get excited about changing vendors and communicating that to their boss. Again, we're not there. So sometimes it take a little bit of practice to with, and I've done it, I've had multiple sessions with our client, the salesperson, and their buyer, helping that buyer communicate why they should change vendors. And especially these big ticket items, that's more important than ever before. Is there a difference, like are there some other concrete differences in your training process that you use for, let's say somebody's in a call center selling auto insurance versus somebody who's uh, you know, an enterprise salesperson selling jet engines? Let's keep going with that one. And what, what, what are you, how do you tweak your six steps? Which ones go down a little bit? Which ones go up and how? Is it the, so it's, it comes down to the six steps again. I wish there was some secret sauce that for the big ticket items, it's totally different than the small ticket items. To be honest with you, the process doesn't change. What will change though is what happens in meeting two, what happens in meeting three and four. On the because usually it's a four or five, sometimes six meeting, multiple email, different documentation process on the big ticket items. But the typical stuff that we're doing of how do we communicate effectively, I, I wish I could tell you it's it's dramatically different. Do we customize it for each client? Yes, but how do you communicate benefits? Doesn't change. How do you build report? Doesn't much change. Our agenda. T point, thank, purpose, outline, input, transition. That format doesn't change. So the framework stays the same. What happens within the framework, that's where the different nuances change between a one time, one call close and a multi call close. You know, it, it does strike me that the there are some tweaks and adaptations of it, right? Still, and then, you know, you live and breathe this stuff, GA, so you're kind of rallying off, but it's thought provoking for me. The, the, the thing that comes back to me here is this is something I read a lot in, in Rackham's book, Spin Selling, where he has this appendix, which he agonizes in this appendix about whether what he's done is real. He says, have I measured this correctly? Like, have I created real impact? Have I, you know, you know many books, yourself, yours as well, you collect data. You say, my, my process is validated, and I've collected data that shows that, that, that we've done good things. The interesting thing that we see in Rackham's book is you have this this fall off, right? So you have this kind of peak, you get the sailing, you the sales training, you're like, I knew it, you know, your next few calls, you deploy it perfectly, it goes great. And then you sort of like, you forget it, right? Stop, right? You go back to the old ways, yep. go back to the old habits. And this is a learning problem, right? So how, how do you keep it in their heads? If, you know, if sales coaches are the ultimate teachers, right? Which, which is evidence in the books that you all write. Um, how do you, you know, really plug it in deep into their minds? So this is something we've been battling with. I've been doing for, looking at for 20 years. Again, when they go through the training, they're super psyched up. They go out there. But here's a, f a few pieces that reason why people don't make it part of their communicational DNA. First thing is this whole what we call verbal knowledge. You went to that class. You went to that seminar. And you walked out. And you saw the instructor do it. Like, ooh, that sounded good. And you think to yourself, ooh, I could do that too. And you do it in your mind. And in your mind, it sounds beautiful. That's what I call verbal knowledge. You can do it, you can hear it, but then I don't know about you, but sometimes what I want to say, or what comes out of my mouth sometimes are two totally different things. So how do you move from verbal knowledge to verbal skill? And verbal skill is being able to actually say what I wanna say out loud. So what I intend to say is what I want and what the prospect hears. So verbal knowledge, knowing what to say, verbal skills, actually be able to say it, to verbal mastery. And verbal mastery is where you can say the right thing at the right time in those critical moments under pressure. And here's the thing. Most people, from verbal knowledge to verbal skill to verbal mastery, it takes practice. And now here's the key too. How much time do most people practice their communication skills? Now think about it. You know, if you're gonna golf, all right, do you just go out to the golf course, go out to the first tee, pull out your Pro V1, get out your Tyler's driver and smack it? Where do you go first? You go to the driving range, right? Then where do you go? Uh, 
Putting green? Thank you very much. Not a trick question, yeah. Dave. You go to the putting green, then do some awesome. chips. And then if for me, where do you go? Uh, the bar. To the Bye. bar. Thank you very much. <laughs> go to the bar. But why do we do all that before we go to the first tee? So that the best version of ourselves shows up. But as salespeople, we often wing it and we go right in the sales process thinking we that we can do it fine without practicing. Here's the other piece about why people don't carry through with their training. Because the first few times you try it, you're not usually not very good at it. And what we see happens all the time is we'll deliver a training and some and we do a lot of follow-up. And we're working with the managers and the coaches internally with our organization that we work with so they can make this part of their organizational communicational DNA. But we'll, I'll be walking in the building and someone come up to me, oh, GA, that whole process thing you taught us, oh, it doesn't work for me. I'll go, really? Let's practice it. Let's practice your credibility statement. Let's practice your YS three by three. And when we practice it, do they crush it? Or do they usually suck? Now, here's the thing. When do most people make a decision about something? When they try it once or twice when their skill level is at its lowest. So therefore, they don't get the results they want. So they say, they say it doesn't work for me. And that's what we see happen all the time is they make a decision on whether it works for them or not when their skill set is at the lowest. So what I tell our clients too is, hey, do me a favor, do not make judgment on this process until you're great at it. And if you are great at it and it does not work, I will take full responsibility. G will take full responsibility. Why? Because I know the process works. I didn't make this stuff up, David. I simply cased it from hundreds, if not thousands of salespeople. Case, C-A-S-E. That's our first acronym of the day. It stands for copy and steal everything. So all I have an opportunity to do is we've had an opportunity just to watch really good salespeople and case from them. So we know this stuff works, but most people, they go to a program, they go to a training, they, it sounds great. They're excited. They try it once or twice in front of a prospect. They don't get the results they want. So they say it doesn't work for me. You've got to practice. And I don't role play. A lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I have to role play. If you know a better way to get somebody to be able to communicate out loud effectively under pressure without role playing, bring it on. I will cut you a fat check because I've not figured it out yet. So we're going to get people out of their comfort zone, up on their feet, practicing what to say how they, and how to say it so they can go from that verbal knowledge to that verbal skill to finally that verbal mastery. So again, they're saying the right thing at the right time in those critical moments under pressure. Yeah, I wonder where my mind goes here is whether there's something unique about folks' resistance to this. And I don't know where my head's at even right now. Because on the one hand, I can say that why, why, would we, you know, why would we reject or worry about getting some, well, why would we not want to get better at something if we're convinced the practice works? Um, is it that, that these skills are something we feel like we already should be good at? And so we're like a little embarrassed to have to practice something that is so kind of natural to human life, right? Just talking to people. And now we have to work at this kind of weird specific way of talking to people. On the other hand, like my kid doesn't want to do his math homework. So maybe we just don't like practicing anything or, or, is, or is sales practice different somehow and, 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 you know, harder for us to get our head around. What I love about you, David, you take such a unique approach on how you look at things that I have to say, wow, I never really thought about it that way. But yes, I do, I do think because we talk every day, that we think that's inherently, I'm already good at that. I'm a salesperson. That's why I got into sales because I have the gift of gab. I mean, if you look at my initials, those are my initials, G-A-B. <laughs> but yes, but again, because I think it makes people uncomfortable. And people, they avoid uncomfortable situations. And so if I'm going to sit there and practice with a peer or practice with a, my boss, I may find out that I'm not as good as I thought I was, <clears throat> or I may embarrass myself a little bit. So I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna put myself in that situation. And people who say, oh, GA, I can't role play, but, but I'm, when I'm with a client, dude, I am nails, I crush it. <clears throat> I throw a flag on that play. If that was the case, again, I don't like sports analogies all that much, but think about it, football teams, they practice five or six days a week for one game. <clears throat> if everybody was better in the game than they were on the practice field, then why practice at all? 
But why do they practice so much? And they don't practice the fancy stuff. They practice the fundamentals over and over and over again. Again, golfers, basketball players, they sit at the free throw line shooting their free throws. Why? So when they're down by one with three seconds left and they get put to the line, they've already done that shot so many times they can sit there and drain it. Why don't salespeople do that? It's sometimes beyond me, my friend. If you're not a professional athlete and you're a professional salesperson, you're a professional communicator, why not practice your skill? Yeah, I would say, you know, I'm just thinking about this too, you know, the people you're referencing there are the best of the best. And those, the heights of those professions might just select for people that just want to practice, right? I was thinking like, you know, you know I was a high school athlete, right? I mean, I didn't want to practice. And, mo and sometimes I didn't practice. And guess what? Uh, that was the end of my athletic career. Whereas, you know, you think about like, think about like Olympics, Olympians or something. They are effect effectively professional practicers. I mean, they'll have like, I don't know how many, how many events they might do in a year. Uh, but it's not a lot. And then what they do, they practice for like eight hours a day, every day, all year. Like that's all they do. So they must love the practice of it as opposed to the performance. And then sales is maybe flipped around. I don't know. Uh, yeah. And again, if you talk to most people, they talk about learning to love the journey. Yeah, right. Learning to love it because they don't love it either. And think about it. Ice skaters. We have the Winter Olympics coming up. Those triple so cows, those double toe loops. Do they do it perfect the first time they try it? No. Where do they end up a lot? On the ice. And it hurts. But are they willing to do something over and over again and do it wrong before they can ever do it right? I talk about it all the time that learning is in the wobbles. You must be willing to do something over and over again and do it wrong before you can ever get really good at it and do it right. But again, I think that most people just aren't willing to go through a little bit of pain. But here's the thing, too, about this whole communication and sales process. Once, it doesn't take long to learn. 60 days, you could have this stuff down. And you know why have I been doing this for 20 years? Because clients have seen results. 60 days, you have this stuff down, you have it for the rest of your life. And my mission is every morning, I get to wake up and make an impact on how people communicate because I truly believe that communication changes people's lives. And so that's why I get up and do what I do every single day. But I think if you're a better communicator in sales, it helps in every single aspect of your life. So why not put a little time, energy, and effort into practicing it so you can get really good at it? What do you got to lose? As it happens, you perfectly, perfectly set up the last topic I wanted to touch on today, which was the, the general application of this. Because I like you say, like in the old world I used to live in, where there was there's this like, I don't know, these these tribes. Let's call them tribes. There's the brokers and the underwriters. And this is in the reinsurance business, so big ticket insurance items. And there was always this kind of concept where people were saying, which which kind are you? You know, are you the broker? Are you a salesperson? Or are you an underwriter? Are you whatever the heck they were? And I was always on the broker side. And I always kind of annoyed me about that because it seemed to me that both are life skills, right? You could probably be able to do one or the other if you cared enough to try to learn how to do one or the other. Uh, and most people wind up through some accident of history uh, that they are, they, they wind up just doing one of the two things and they don't ever switch. And so they, 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 they don't, they neglect perhaps developing a skill from the other side of their tribe, that they might, or maybe they do develop it, but they do call it something else. So maybe you could talk about what are the things you get good at in your real life? Like, does this help your marriage, right? Help be dealing with your kids. Does it make you worse at it in some kind of strange way, perhaps? Uh, how, how do you, how, how should you expect your life to change, if at all, by being phenomenal salesperson or learning to be a phenomenal salesperson? So, I mean, I can only, you know, I've been married one time, 29 years to love my wife, Kelly. Uh, so there's something to it. But if Kelly sees me starting to use some of my classroom stuff, she mainly oh, yeah. lets me know I'm not, a, I'm not one of your students. She'll say, gee, I've seen you, you mastered, you know, the art of, of controlling your classroom. I'm not a class member. So I've had to learn not to do that. But yeah. again, communication, it's all about listening and asking good questions and taking a genuine interest in, in another person. So how can that not help you in relationships? How can that not help you be a better father, a better, better wife, a better husband? And so, yes, I think that the skills you learn as a salesperson are universal because it's not about selling. I tell people all the time, first thing I say in the classroom, 
I'm not going to ask you to sell anything to anybody. So I think people hate to be sold. But do they love to buy? So I'm going to ask you to make a positive buying experience for your prospect. And again, do I use certain ta tactics? Yes. If I'm in an argument with somebody, I could objection response, objection response, and become very confrontational. Or I could clarify and ask some good questions and listen first. Seek to understand before I can be understood and listen to understand versus listen to respond. That's probably one of the biggest things that I mess up on. You know, a couple of months ago, we actually had my nephew in town and he loves tennis. And so my wife thought it would be really cool if he was able to take some tennis lessons while he was in town with us. And so while he was in town, for, he was in, it was for two weeks over the summer. I went and I had to go to Chicago. I was in Chicago for a couple of days. My wife called me up. I'm like, hey, honey, what's going on? He goes, oh. I'm really upset with, 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 with your nephew, Tyler. All of a sudden, he's my nephew, even though it's really hers. I'm like, what's going on? She's like, well, if I just dropped him off at his tennis lesson. You know how excited I was about his tennis lesson? And when he got in the car, or when he got him out of the car for his lesson, he didn't have any shoes on. So I immediately said, well, honey, how come when Tyler got in the car, why didn't you look at his feet? Now, how did Mrs. Barton respond to me trying to solve her problem? Very helpful of you, Gia. Thank you for suggesting that. Yes. No. Yes. So then I decided <laughs> to get my shovel out and dig a little deeper. And I said, "Well, honey, there's a no. There's there's a at the club. There's a little little uh, sports shop. Maybe there's some shoes there. Or it looks like you still have time to run home, get his shoes, or maybe stop by over at Dick's Sporting Goods to get him a, pair, a new pair of shoes. You probably could use a new pair. Now, again, why did Mrs. Bartek call me 1,500 miles away if she didn't want me to solve her problem? Was I listening to understand or was I listening to respond? So again, listen to understand. If I would have simply said, hey, honey, wow, that's got to be frustrating to get all the way to the club and realize that that Tyler didn't have any shoes on, you know, I get that. Then she says, oh, honey, thank you so much. All she wanted was a hug from 1,500 miles, huh? Did she want me to solve her problem? No. But as salespeople, what do we think we want to do every time? Solve it. Solve the problem. So. Listen to understand before you listen to respond. And yes, even today, I still screw up. Amen, brother. That's that time, GA. Um, how can people find you? Where where can they go? Silver Bullet Selling, you can buy that. Book forthcoming, title forthcoming. Where can yep, you find yep. them online? So Concilio Team, C-O-N-S-I-L-I-O Team, T E A M dot com. But also, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, compliments, hey, what gets me up out, out in the morning? away from my wife, my three kids, our three greyhounds, our two guinea pigs and our turtle, is I went from being unemployed to really every single day being able to make an impact in people's lives. So if I can help you out, feel free. Give me a call. My number, cell, 858-212-4486. Again, 858-212-4486. Or email me at ga at conciliateam.com. And I'm serious. I would love to hear from you and Hear where you're at right now and see if there's anything we can do to help you be more effective. So it won't just help you in sales, it'll help you in every aspect of your life. And David, I was going to say, hey, it's always a treat, always a pleasure. Again, the way you look at things, the way you study them, and it's just a unique perspective that I really honor and respect. And thank you very much for being allowed to share some of my thoughts with, with all the people who know and love you. My guest today is G.A. Bartik. Thank you very much. Thank you.